Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. My name is Sarah Belline. I'm the program manager for the New America Fellows Program, and I'm so pleased to welcome you. Uh, thank you to CORE for co-hosting this event with us, for sharing their beautiful space with us. I'm so pleased to welcome Joshua Yaffa tonight for his new book, Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition, and Compromise in Putin's Russia. So Joshua is a 2016 New America Fellow, and he's a correspondent for The New Yorker based out of Moscow. And tonight, Josh will be joined by Miriam Elder. Miriam is a senior politics reporter at BuzzFeed. Before we get started, I have a couple of quick uh, housekeeping points. First of all, and I think there are some in the room, if you're a journalist and you're looking for funding for mentorship, a community of peers to work with you as you develop your next idea, uh, please consider applying to be a New America Fellow. Um, the fellowship uh, application closes at the uh, beginning of February, and if you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to chat more about it with you, and I'm sure Josh would be happy to share his experience as well, which I hope was positive. Um, we also have two other New America NYC events happening this week, um, one tomorrow night here at the Core Club um, featuring uh, Lee Drutman and his book, um, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop. So if you're interested in that event or our event later in the week, uh, please visit our website or ask any of the New America staff. My last bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to our guests of honor is that Josh's book is out in the lobby and will be for sale after the event, and Josh would be happy to sign it for you. So please consider buying a copy, supporting Josh, supporting our bookselling partner, Books on Call. So with that, please join me in welcoming Josh and Miriam. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, Josh, congratulations uh, on writing a really compelling book that is sort of uh, a series of portraits of people who are living in Russia today um, or who have lived there recently and are live their lives making compromises so they can figure out how to survive and thrive uh, in, in Putin's Russia. Um, and what I'd love to start off with is so you're dropping this book at a time when reporting on Russia is incredibly polarized. We have a fairly black and white portrait of the country uh, here in, the con in, in, in America, having gone through Russiagate and now everything with uh, the impeachment trial even. And I'd love to start off with, like, was that your intention? Was it your intention to, to show us that it wasn't a black and white country or what was it? And I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I know that you've written a bit about this in the introduction and if you want to read something from it. Uh, th thanks, Miriam, and thanks to everyone for uh, coming tonight. It wasn't my intention. Or I didn't really understand what my intention was right away when um, I got to Moscow in, in 2012 when, when you were there uh, working as a journalist. Uh, also, and it took some time for me to understand what it was I wanted to say, at least in, in book length. And as you alluded to, the first prism that I started to view Russia through and, and uh, use in my journalistic work was essentially Putin and his minions, the many mini Putins around the country, uh, versus the brave mini Sakharovs or Solzhenitsyns, the, the people who, uh, uh, who do exist and who do uh, bravely at great risk themselves uh, oppose uh, or uh, stand up to Putin's regime. And that's uh, uh, an understandable and, and very compelling journalistic story that's definitely true. But it also, as I came to understand with time, misses a larger and in some sense, I think, more true story about Russia as I came to experience and understand it, which is about all the people in the middle who are really in their everyday accommodations and even compromises not that dissimilar to you or I, or in other words, I'm not sure that if we scramble the snow globe of fate that I would be a brave uh, human rights campaigner or opposition politician who at great risk to myself and family stood up to the Putin regime. I might look for another path to realize my talents, make use of my education, have a nice life for myself and my family. Uh, and just as would be the case, uh, just as I knew would be true for me, so it was true for so many people in Russia. And I felt like understanding the way that actually works uh, for them in their everyday lives might be a way of understanding Russia outside of that dichotomy, which 
I began to understand had limited explanatory uh, or analytical um, power. It wasn't until I came across an essay by a Russian uh, sociologist named Yuri Levada that I had a name for what it was I was thinking and seeing in this kind of creeping way. Uh, and the essay uh, um, is called The Wily Man, uh, and it was Levada's attempt to make sense of what had happened to his fellow citizens in the years after the Soviet collapse. Why hadn't they become these uh, free-thinking, self-actualized Democrats, as maybe some people would expect when the Soviet Union collapsed. Instead, they had conformed and compromised and become very adaptive citizens of a new Russia. And I'll read just a line or two from that essay. Um, the Russian wily man, Levada wrote, not only tolerates deception, but is willing to be deceived and even requires self-deception for the sake of his own self-preservation. He adapts to social reality, looking for oversights and gaps in the ruling system, looking to use the rules of the game for his own interest, but at the same time, and no less important, he is constantly trying to circumvent those very same rules. Uh, I'll read another just couple paragraphs from the introduction where I begin with that prism or framework of the wily man to make sense uh, of the world around me that I saw in Moscow in recent years. In Moscow and in my travels around the country, I met fiercely proud and brilliant men and women, activists, economists, journalists, business owners, who believed the best, if not the only, way to realize their vision was in concord with the state. It was hard to believe they were wrong, nor was I confident I would choose any differently. There was my friend with a graduate degree from Oxford who came back to Moscow to take a job in a state-run think tank, a place where smart young professionals thought up good ideas half of which were implemented, and the other half of which, those with more worrying political implications, were discarded. I would periodically have lunch with a youth activist who had been unable to resist the offer to take a seat in Parliament, where he was quickly told to vote along party lines, as the Kremlin dictated, or risk losing the funding for his youth programs. For a while, the most fashionable job in Moscow was working on state-funded urban beautification projects, expanding pedestrian zones, renovating city parks, launching bike sharing programs, rethinking public transport routes. Such initiatives made the city undeniably more pleasant and humane. With time, similar efforts expanded to other cities around the country. Even in the absence of larger democratic reforms, if anything, Russia's politics tacked in an opposite, unmistakably regressive direction, its cities became more desirable, attractive, and enjoyable places to live. A debate emerged among my friends in Moscow, is it laudable to lend one's talents and expertise to the state so as to achieve real change on a local level? Or does this only help perpetuate an unjust and inefficient system? This question was never really settled, but surfaced time and again, a referendum on the permissibility of compromise that repeated at regular intervals. Does harnessing the resources and power of institutions you ultimately consider malevolent to achieve something good mean the joke is on them or you? Although the gulag is a mostly unhelpful metaphor for understanding Putin's Russia, I found myself returning to one thing Solzhenitsyn wrote about in the camps. If you're stuck inside an unjust system, isn't cheating it a bit here and there for your own purposes an entirely rational, even virtuous response? Maybe there are no good answers to these questions. An impossibility captured in the Russian saying, between two fires, the condition of being stuck in the middle of two opposing forces bigger than yourself. Making it out the other side is just about the best outcome available. The more I thought and wrote about the ways people live and work in Putin's Russia, the more I realized it was largely impossible to separate them into two camps, the oppressed and the oppressors. Yes, there were obvious victims and those whose resolute, unyielding positions brought them great frustration and hardship, just as there were the unambiguously corrupt and sadistic who used the state's authority merely to line their pockets or who got off on enacting all manner of petty cruelties. But most of the people I encountered were neither. They were strivers, nimble and resourceful, who usually set out with virtuous and thoroughly understandable motives. What fascinated me were the compromises and prevarications required in bringing those initial motives to life, and how, over time, those concessions can change a person and the very rationale that motivated one's actions in the first place. So pretty early on in the book, you toy with 
taking on the persona of the wily man yourself and you're weighing this decision of whether to appear on a propaganda program on state-run TV where the whole point is to denigrate the West. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your decision-making process in participating in kind of the propaganda machine, um, whether you were successful in your goals, and now with reflection, whether you think it was the right decision to, to do that? Sure. There was a, an element of just purely selfish repertorial uh, curiosity in that decision. I went in very clear-eyed that I was there to get material for my book. So maybe that was, maybe in, indeed you're right in, in calling that a moment of kind of wily self-justification um, because they were, of course, getting something useful out of it too, maybe more useful uh, in that. Interestingly, Russian state TV is actually desperate for live breathing Americans who are willing to be subjected to that experience on um Live television. I guess there aren't that many of us in Moscow, and even less who are willing to be sort of beaten around like a birthday party pinata for an hour on on television. Um, uh, and I and I did it purely because I wanted to see what it was like on the factory floor of the state propaganda enterprise, uh, which I think I achieved somewhat, um, and, and was able to narrate in the in the chapter about Channel One, the the main state channel where I appeared, how the sausage gets made, I guess you could say, and what it feels like on the receiving end of it. And it was interesting, I guess I should say first and foremost, really frustrating, but but also interesting to see how clearly defined and ultimately inescapable my role was on the show. I was actually allowed to say anything I wanted. Um, in that sense, I wasn't censored. They never cut off my mic, uh, or what was the subject? What were you talking about? Lots of different things. I went on half a dozen times, um, always concerning various machinations of America. Why is America so unreliable? So hypocritical? Uh, the questions were, um, always leading, uh, like Joshua, don't you think that's when, you know, Obama forever ruined the, um, wouldn't you agree, Joshua, that that's when Obama forever ruined, you know, the image of America in the eyes of the world, that sort of question. Um, but even in my protestations, I was ultimately part of the overall spectacle because, as I write about in the chapter, the clever innovation of Putin-era propaganda as opposed to Soviet-era propaganda is that all voices are welcome. And in fact, the noisier the conversation, the better, because everything ends up in this cacophonous information soup that's impossible for the viewer to parse or make sense of. And so me screaming, and in fact, the other unfortunate thing about the nature of the show is you can say anything you want, but you have to scream oftentimes to get your point across. And then you become just another screaming, talking head who's interchangeable with the screaming, talking head next to you. And how would a viewer judge the relative merits of my points versus, uh, let's say, a Russian parliamentarian who is another guest on the show that day who's screaming at me, and we just become two screaming people whose voices somehow uh, cancel each other out. So uh, it was interesting to observe that in action. And, and I had written about, as a viewer and analyst of Russian state media, the way that innovation works in practice, the way that Russian state media, for example, was able to very cleverly and successfully mask Russian responsibility for the shoot down of the MH17, uh, fl the flight over, that was flying over Eastern Ukraine in 2014 and the way by throwing up all manner of theories that were themselves contradictory and thus kind of absurd, it couldn't actually be this and that and this other thing all at the same time. But by putting up all of these theories on TV, the Russian viewer was left feeling like, and that other fourth version that the West was saying that it was shot down by and the Russian anti-aircraft uh, missile was equally, was just as unlikely or likely uh, impossible uh, to know with any certainty. And so... I was reduced essentially to a character in that same kind of uh, performance. Um, and I guess I'm glad I did it so as to write about it with a bit more tactile uh, detail, though I also understood I was there not by accident and not because of their generosity. Right. It's sort of like legitimizing what, what they want to do. Sure. And I was a necessary or at least useful character in that drama. It's actually useful to have an American come on because then the overall effect can be, well, see, he's he's sounds just like 
us, what he's saying is no more or less credible than what we have to say. He's screaming just like we are. So you see, there's nothing so. Were you really screaming? At points, it gets really frustrating. Is there video uh, of this that uh, we can uh, all look up on the internet? Yeah, it, it takes, thankfully, some complicated Googling, like Channel One, despite the amount, uh, huge number of resources that channel has, their search engine optimization is terrible. So for the fact checking of the book, it actually became really difficult to find these segments. It, uh, they're buried in like the, you know, practically the dark web, which is now um, for my intents and purposes a relief. Uh, but uh, they are they are out there. So my absolute favorite chapter in the book is about Dr. Lisa. Um, for those in the audience who don't know about her, maybe you could tell a little bit about her and then I'll ask you my sure. some questions. So uh, Dr. Lisa's full name is Elisabetta Glinka. She's a doctor who uh, spent some time in the U.S. with her husband in the 90s. And it was there that she was introduced in um, Vermont sorry, to uh, palliative care, palliative medicine. She worked at a hospice and was really struck by the dignity that the patients at the hospice were treated with. And medical care like that, palliative care, didn't really exist at all, not in the Soviet Union and not in post-Soviet Russia. And uh, she, on her return to Russia, was the first person to bring that kind of medicine to um, Russia. And the terminally ill were, and to a large extent, remain a population that not just modern Russia, but Russia in the Soviet uh, uh, times either didn't really know how to make sense of. There wasn't a lot of um, there wasn't a lot of understanding of how to to treat and care for the terminally ill, other than keeping them out of sight, out of mind, essentially. And Dr. Lisa um, began working with that population, and and also quickly began working with another marginalized population, the homeless in Moscow, and started going to the Pavelitsky train station to do on-site street medical care, bringing them food, bringing them warm clothing. And this was all at a time when Moscow, you were there in those years, was going through this incredible oil-fueled boom, uh, this real kind of euphoric uh, high of, of um, wealth and opportunity, and um, people like the homeless or the terminally ill didn't really fit into that narrative. And it was left to people like Dr. Lisa to, to look after them. And that gave her especially in Moscow's, let's say, liberal intelligentsia circles, a really uh, esteemed reputation. She became quite popular, and people supported her charity, which was called Fair Help. And it was in 2014 when things really changed for her, like things changed in Russia writ large and for so many other people after the annexation of Crimea, the outbreak of war in eastern Ukraine, out of her humanitarian impulse she felt compelled uh, to begin treating the sick and injured, especially children in eastern Ukraine, who were largely on rebel-held territory, territory controlled by the Russia-backed separatist uh, forces and, and, and Russian direct Russian soldiers uh, as well. And that inserted her into a political battle that she didn't want anything to do with, but she was willing to make that sacrifice. And I think it was a sacrifice for her to become so involved in this um, really political uh, battle and to lose many friends in back in Russia, Russian liberals who thought that Russia's war in Ukraine was an outrage. Uh, and Dr. Lisa was somehow lending her legitimacy to that operation by making the Kremlin somehow seem much more uh, humanitarian than, of course, its intentions ever were to make Putin look like he was some great humanitarian in Ukraine rather than being the person who um, started the war. But she did all of that because for her, the opportunity uh, to save a life, especially a child's life, was much more uh, important. And the Kremlin gave her incredible resources, resources she wouldn't have had on her own to do so. Uh, she got planes from the emergency ministry to bring injured children out. She was able to get them uh, hospital beds and very expensive, complicated operations back in Russia. And the real, the thing about Russia, and I, I narrate this in different ways in the lives of different characters in the book, is when the state decides uh, to lend you a hand, essentially, when you fall in the state's favor, the resources can be unparalleled. Uh, I write about a theater director named Kirill Serebnikov, who is the premier is the premier avant-garde experimental theater director of his generation. And for a while, when the state decided it had what turned out to be a fleeting interest in avant-garde culture, he basked in the kinds of resources that a cultural figure, a director, could only dream of. Uh, and the same thing was true 
uh, for Dr. Lisa. If her mission was to help the sick and injured, there was no one who could help her do that uh, like the state. And uh, her story ends on a very tragic note. In 2015, when Russia began its military intervention in Syria, she was roped into that conflict as well, shall we say, also uh, to present a humanitarian face to that intervention. She traveled to Syria with the Russian military, visited hospitals, delivered medicines, and it was on one of those trips in December 2016, flying on a Russian uh, defense ministry plane from Sochi, shortly after takeoff, the plane crashed into the Black Sea, killing everyone on board, including Dr. Lisa. So it's a dramatic and maybe in a way the most dramatic case in the entire book of where that relationship, uh, that proximity to the state both provided someone with unparalleled opportunities to realize whatever it was that was important to them in life, but also in this direct way ended up being the thing that led to her death. Yeah, part of the reason that chapter spoke to me so much, aside from the fact that she is such a, or was such a, a compelling figure and did something so unique in Russia, like she almost, um, she almost like revolutionized the idea of charity work uh, in Russia. It was also that it was kind of one of the cleanest examples of somebody really compromising um, themselves, um, getting something and suffering the worst fate. And I just, I called out a couple of quotes um, that some lines that you wrote in that chapter, because it was questions that was like weighing on me as I was reading the book. So one, as I have my terrible eyesight, was um, you wrote, her attempts at neutrality were taken as the exact opposite. And then a few lines later you write, she had tried to steer clear of politics, but the thing about war is that it is an inherently political event. And this is something that kind of hung over me as I was reading the whole book, because it's, it's not just war that's an inherently political event, especially you know, when you're living in an authoritarian country, if that's how we want to describe Putin's Russia, then every choice is in some way um, political. And do you, do you believe that there can be such a thing as like clean compromise or clean neutrality in a country like Russia? Isn't somebody always kind of choosing sides? D definitely. Well, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the latter part. I'm, I'm not, uh, but I I'm definitely agree with you on the first part in that it is uh, false to think you can engage in a clean compromise. I'm not sure that's particular to Putin's Russia. I think it's more acute in Putin's Russia. I think that's probably true in lots of cases here. It's probably true in Trump's Washington with lots of people who uh, have gone into that administration one way or another thinking that they can do some good with their expertise and experience, and it turns out things are more tricky than that, um, and the compromises you have to make along the way change you and, and change the very reason maybe why you entered into them in the first place. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, that there are some particularities to Putin's Russia, but maybe there's also more universality in the way that compromise works and how it uh, changes you and the motives you set out with in the very beginning. But as for Russia today, I do think it's uh, sadly, tragically, especially for the characters in this book, false to think you can engage in the kind of clean compromise you, you mentioned. No, the state is always going to uh, extract its uh, pound of flesh uh, one way or another. And of course, it's just not a fair fight. Uh, the resources and power of the state apparatus versus you, uh, it's always going to come out in the long run in, in the state's uh, favor. And that happened with Serebnikov, the theater director I mentioned, who fell from grace and ended up being charged with embezzlement and ended up under house arrest. He's now out from under house arrest. He's kind of had a third act, uh, a quasi-resurrection after his fall uh, from grace, though that story could twist um, yet again. But he's definitely, just as he was at the state's mercy to a certain degree when it decided it had this interest in supporting avant-garde art. He was just at its mercy, just the same at its mercy when the state decided it no longer had that interest and in fact found something useful in putting him on this kind of show trial to send a message in another way. The state wanted to send a message about its support for avant-garde art, art. Then the state wanted to send a message about, you know, putting um, such artists and cultural figures on notice. So he was always, uh, uh, I mean, he, was, he wasn't, a purely passive actor in that drama, but the power dynamic was such where he was always going to be in a reactive uh, mode. Same thing uh, with uh, with Dr. Lisa. And 
so on the, uh, for me, on the one hand, there was the Dr. Lisa chapter, which I really, it's, her life story is just, uh, it's incredible and tragic. Um, and then the flip side for me was was the, the chapter on Konstantin Ernst, which some of you may have read because it was excerpted uh, in The New Yorker. I find him such a difficult character to understand and to try, I was trying to understand him as like the compromises that he made for himself because on the one hand he loves art he loves to be kind of forward looking but he's obviously running um one of you know the major propaganda outlets um in the country and the question that that his life story raised for me was i would love to hear your thoughts on what's the difference between a compromiser and a collaborator it's a good good question in fact that very uh question was raised by uh Russian political philosopher, I guess you could say, Kirill Rogov, the summer, and I quote that a bit in the in the prologue, and he, um, in the context of protests that were happening in Moscow at the time around municipal elections, put that very question forward, and that sparked an interesting debate that I talk a bit about in, in the prologue because he happened to hit on the very question that I had been um, wrestling with. I think there are two types of characters in the book, at least the way I see it. There are those whose compromise brings them into the system itself. Someone like Ernst, he went from being this kind of counterculture, perestroika era hippie auteur who had long hair and wore a black uh, leather motorcycle jacket and made shows about Fassbinder movies and um, went to the running of the bulls uh, and all of that, uh, which was very weird for 1990, um, late Soviet Union. Uh, to being, as you say, the head of the most powerful state media outlet in the country, and therefore, in a certain sense, as I say in the in the book, and was excerpted in the New Yorker, the kind of unofficial minister of propaganda, and it's a very interesting arc to me. Um, but he's someone who entered the state and became part and parcel of the Putin system. You know, he's a full-fledged uh, inner circle uh, member and traded in a way that's understandable to me. I don't necessarily, un understanding is not the same as uh, approving, um, let alone applauding, but he uh, went to the one place that could give him, kind of like with Serebnik of the director, but to an even more exaggerated degree, all the resources in the world to realize all of his creative interests and impulses. And there are, are there is actually a fair degree of interesting sometimes even edgy cultural programming on Channel One. So he's been given this license and this instrument to produce programs um, that, as far as Russian contemporary culture goes, are, are really good and some of the best stuff um, out there. The price he pays for that is also lending his channel or, or using his channel as the chief propaganda arm or one of the chief propaganda arms um, of, of the state. But he's really in the system. He's not using it in this glancing, episodic way, like, say, Dr. Lisa, who shows up every now and then, asks Putin or those around him for something, can you change the law in a certain way so I can treat more people who fled the conflict in Ukraine? Can I have more planes to bring out more sick people? She never joined the system. And as you quoted, she tried, maybe not totally successfully, to really remain apart from it. She, she insisted on her neutrality, she insisted on how she was outside of politics, even as that became, I think, a difficult position to defend. Nonetheless, she was not going to cross that line and, and join the system in some formal way that made her a part of it. She was gonna use it to her advantage and use it to do good, but she wasn't going to be um, one of its uh, members. Whereas someone like Ernst has really gone all the way in um, and, and become exactly the thing that Dr. Lisa was unwilling to. Yeah, and I guess I was thinking about Ernst also because in compromising himself, or it's for me it's very hard not to read him as a collaborator because he then, in control of this entire propaganda unit, kind of takes away the choice for compromise from all the people, the millions of Russians uh, you know who are watching his channel, and so you you spent you spent quite a bit of time with him. Um, did you ask him about that? About the power that he felt over like the minds of millions of his citizens? For him, it's a real high, and I think a great joy. Um, he spoke about it a bit 
in the book, which I quote, and I also talked to some of his uh, friends. It was interesting to talk to his one-time collaborator and one-time close friend, Leonid Parfionov. They made a wonderful show together uh, in the 90s called Old Songs About Important Things that was a way to really resurrect the Soviet cultural legacy and provide it a modern context and to demonstrate to millions of Russians who were really disoriented after the Soviet collapse that there was actually something really worthy at least in the cultural heritage from the Soviet era, and here's how we can bring it forward uh, and make sense of it in our new context. And so they did that show together, and they became very close friends. Their paths diverged as Parfionov, um, uh, due to his kind of stubborn, free-thinking independence, um, drifted, or rather was pushed further and further off state airwaves, whereas Ernst doubled down on his choice and rose to this position of great power. But Parfionov told me something interesting for the book that I, I won't be able to quote exactly verbatim, but essentially uh, Ernst always dreamed of being the kind of visionary who could impart a style on an era, who could, who could teach people about themselves and the time in which they lived, uh, and to provide these touchstones that helped people, or, or, or guideposts even, uh, for people to make sense of, um, of the era in which they lived. And he said, for, for Ernst, that's a great high and I'm sure a great joy. Uh, and I think that's, um, that's true. Ernst said something to me, essentially, that these are, my, these are my people, these are my fellow citizens, I love them. So what I remember him, him telling me about the Russians, the millions of Russians who watch Channel One. And so I think he sees himself as providing, in his mind, a really useful and necessary service, I guess uh, you could say, for through television, helping people make sense uh, of the era in which they live, and, and in a way that mirrors, I think, Putin's understanding of his own rule, bringing people out or, or giving a hand to people to come out of a time of anxiety and anarchy and chaos and bring them into a, an era of uh, stability and predictability and resurgent power that image was fed back to them on the television screen and, and helped them uh, move into that new era. I think that's how Ernst would see his role. How did you write this book without judgment? Because like, he, you know, hearing that that point of view that's coming from him or hearing how like he loved modern art, not that I'm making a comparison between Putin's Russia and Nazi Germany, but I just like had the name Riefenstahl like floating, you know, in the back of my head. And how did you then this book is written in such a way where you're like, these are people who exist. Um, was it hard not to to write about it with judgment? Is that something you tried? I, I definitely tried uh, to do exactly that, and I'm glad it reads that way. Part of the the answer was solved in the pre-writing or even pre-reporting casting phase of the book, I guess you could say, and when I was searching for characters, and I was clear from the very beginning that I wanted to write about people that I would be able to emerge from the reporting and writing process not having judged not having reached a definitive moral conclusion about were they good, were they bad, did I approve or disapprove of their compromise. So I was very aware from the beginning that if someone seemed either just too uh, cynical, too transparently um, uh, selfish in their motivations and in what guided their compromise, I wasn't interested. Um, and at the, at the other end, if someone was just too much, uh, veered too much to the kind of Sakharov model uh, of someone who really sacrificed um, everything and, and, and was you know stubbornly uh, stubbornly refused to compromise, that also wasn't interesting. Although there is one character, I think, in the book who gets close to that, the priest, um, Pavel Adelgame, who really resisted the church's growing proximity to the state in the Putin years. But nonetheless, my, my principle was I want to find people who challenge or make impossible my own conclusive moral judgment and I think, or I guess I succeeded, if you're saying the book reads as, um, as you say it does, and I'm, I'm glad to hear, but that, that was an important element to me of the book, and I, and I think one of the main ways I solved it was in uh, who I picked uh, to, to write about. Um, so there's a chapter where you, um, you like go inside the mind of a, basically like a Russian nationalist in Crimea, and this is one of those chapters where you're reminded why like why why books are written? This is this could never have been a story, right? It would have probably been torn apart on the internet. Like why do we need this point of view? But this is a man who he owns two zoos in Crimea, 
and you describe him, <clears throat> you know, they're they're fans of Putin, fans of the Kremlin. They see a Lenin statue fallen on the ground and they start crying as a family. They embrace Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea. Um, and why why do you think that going into like his mind and explaining what's motivating him is important? I guess, I would, you know, it's not a perspective that makes it across in uh, in U.S. media often and possibly ever. So I've, I'm curious as a reader, what do you want me or us to walk away with as a reader from uh, from getting to know that guy? Well, I, I definitely knew I wanted a character from Crimea for maybe exactly that reason, that it's it's a place that we heard a lot about in 2014 and then kind of disappeared from the media radar for understandable reasons. Uh, first and foremost, unfortunately, logistical. It's very hard to get to post-annexation uh, Crimea. And I narrate a bit in the book about the various um, logistical rigmarole involved of getting to Kiev, getting a, a pass from the Ukrainian authorities, traveling down uh, across a, a very fraught um, land border with two border crossings. So it's just it's hard to get to uh, Crimea. And after 2014, I think media interest in Crimea quickly waned and new conflicts and crises um, emerged. And so there was this place where these incredibly intense and bizarre uh, events happened and then we we all collectively, myself included, put our attention um, elsewhere. And I wanted to understand what actually had happened, what's happened uh, since, and to also take seriously, I guess, why was it that not just Putin, but so many Russians welcomed the annexation uh, of Crimea, found something really just and correct in it. And I didn't want, since, since I'm writing a book about Russia and Russians, and especially trying to understand their psychological inner lives, I felt like it would be only correct to understand uh, from the ground what was it like uh, both in those sort of heady, strange days of 2014 and, and since, and why might s someone have welcomed uh, the annexation of Crimea, something that to us, without much kind of interrogation or examination, we just dismiss as you know illegal and unjust and all of that, which is not incorrect, but why was it that millions of people thought otherwise millions of people who most interesting to me if you sat down with them and listened to them could sound eminently reasonable and understandable with personal experiences and histories that made sense within the context of their own lives and this guy Oleg Zubkov who is ethnically Russian but had lived in Crimea with his family for many years was exactly that and I should say his opinion of Russia and annexation changes dramatically what he experiences and lives uh, through in as a new citizen of Russia in post-annexation Crimea really disappoints him, to put it mildly, and he beca he really sours on uh, annexation, and it turns against him in this very Kafka-esque way where he's wrapped up into all sorts of absurd legal battles and the very existence of his parks is threatened, uh, and he really feels like uh, no small degree of buyer's remorse, um, shall we say, even as he acknowledges in this very Russian uh, fatalistic or, or stoic way, like, well, you know, I, I got what I asked for, so I guess I, I shouldn't uh, complain. But nonetheless, um, annexation has not turned out for him the way he thought. But the fact is, as you say, he was very much a rah-rah, pro-Russia, pro-Putin patriot um, in 2014. And um, I thought that was an interesting and important perspective to get in the book because how else do we make sense of, of those events and, and why they happened? It wasn't just Putin alone deciding, although that is actually what made it all possible, but it wouldn't have been possible for Putin to snap his fingers and decide to do that if there wasn't this pre-existing sentiment that I wanted to understand and explore. So you've mentioned um, Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn a couple of times, um, and the history books are usually written through, you know, with, with those men as, as main characters. And as I got to the end of the book, I started thinking like, oh, this whole idea of compromise it seems to rest on the idea of accepting Putin as like the forever ruler of Russia. Um, is that correct? <laughs> is like, do you think that that reporting on Russia being so much about the machinations in the Kremlin and then focusing on opposition to Putin, do you think that's the wrong way to report on Russia? I don't think it's necessarily the wrong way, but I do think it's the incomplete uh, way to report around about Russia. And, and it depends on what you want out of your news and, and what you're looking for as a reader. The, the 
political story really is Putin-centric. That's not an exaggeration. He does hold an outsized, monopolistic hold on power in Russia. So if you want to understand the political course of the country, it's unavoidably correct to focus on Putin and, and those around him and to play Putinology in the way that Kremlinology was the way that uh, a, g a generation previous or two made sense of what was happening in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and there is something interesting uh, happening with uh, the opposition as well, and that also deserves our attention, especially this summer. We spoke a bit about there were some protests that threatened to at least uh, not topple Putin, but at least scramble the kind of governing architecture, the rules of the game for, for Putin and those around him, and all those are interesting and important stories. I just don't think it gets across what it's actually like to live in Russia and to be there circa 2020. I don't think you know, this book was partially written, I guess, as a way of saying, you know, either metaphorically or literally handing to someone who asks, what's it really like to live in Russia? You know, maybe I read your articles about various political things and, you know, analyzing Putin, Trump, what's really going on and all of that. And if someone says, well, what's, what's it really like to to be in Russia, to live in Russia, I, I hope this book is uh, at least partially um, an answer to that. So you wrote this book while <clears throat> Russiagate, I mean, I assume you wrote this book while Russiagate had like reached its mm -hmm. frenzy, right? Yes. Where like Rachel Maddow was unspooling things every evening. Um, how did you personally manage the demands of trying to keep in touch with what your editors were probably screaming at you from New York versus what you were seeing in Russia and what you were wanting to focus on with the book. Was that hard? Yeah, though maybe I kind of benefited from a bifurcated working life where I could feed the beast of, of Russia mania uh, in 2017, so 16, 17, and then sort of retreat to the book. Those were the years when I was uh, reporting the book. Uh, I hadn't yet sat down to write, so it was actually a relief to fly to Perm, for example, to even fly to Chechnya. Uh, felt like uh, a bit of a break um, from trying to answer what ultimately turned out to be the unanswerable, maybe because there is no answer at the heart of the question in, in, in terms of uh, Trump, Russia, and Trump, Putin, and what really uh, happened there. I never solved it, nor did my uh, colleagues, so I guess to my relief, better if, if I couldn't <laughs> solve it, I guess I'm glad that no one else quite could um, either, which maybe means it is an unsolvable um, question. And it was frustrating First and foremost, as a reporter, like like you, you understand if if you you do want to, uh, it, it's not just because I want to please my editors. It's my own internal drive as a reporter to get to the bottom of things. So it was frustrating to feel like you were banging your head against a wall uh, repeatedly uh, on 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 Trump Russia stuff. But I actually enjoyed. I was glad that there was this place to retreat to, and I could go talk to Dr. Lisa's husband, uh, an incredibly stoic and, and generous uh, man who was quite. Um, welcoming uh, to me and, and quite uh, pleased, uh, I guess that's the right word, to, to narrate the story of his wife's life and, and or fly to Perm, where I wrote about this museum set on the site of a former uh, prison colony. It was uh, rewarding to be able to get into what I felt like was, quote, real Russia or, or back to understanding Russia as Russia, as opposed to Russia through the prism of, of Trump. So um, I was going to have to do the Trump stuff regardless, so better that I had this other um, uh, parallel reporting life to, to fall back on. 